And again, welcome to everybody to this uh, uh, satsang in honor of one of our gurus, uh, mm -hmm. Lord Jesus Christ, today being Christmas. And I can't help but think back to when uh, Swamiji was with us and all those years that uh, together we would celebrate Christmas at Ananda Village. And he based it basically, he would do what Master would do on those Christmas days. What he would he would like, and following Master's tradition, he would, uh, we would have uh, the eight hour meditation on the 23rd. And I hope uh, many of you were able to do that as well. And uh, there at uh, Pune, I know you had one. So we had that here, that here at Ananda Village again this year. And then he would, on the 24th, um, on the Christmas Eve, he, uh, there would usually be some sort of a musical concert or something like that. And then on Christmas Day, he would invite everybody, uh, Swamiji would, he would invite people to his home. And it would be a social day where people would come, usually in the afternoon a little bit. And in the afternoon, people would just come. And it was it's sort of a traditionally in America anyway. It's a day of visiting friends, family, wishing one another a good cheer, happy Christmas, Merry Christmas. and. So he would have that and people would come and refreshments would be served. And often, many of the times, as many of you know, Swami Kriyananda was famous for being a, a uh, you might say a devotee of P.G. Woodhouse uh, <laughs> <laughs> stories. And he would, he loved to read these, uh, these humorous stories of P.G. Woodhouse and taking on the characters and the accents of all the different, he would put on, you might say vocally, step into the role of all the different characters and he would read these things and these stories and then of course you know that in the afternoon would go and then people would would go home and it was always it was such a very informal way that would uh, we would celebrate and master would do pretty much the same thing and he would follow that same tradition and master would give his blessings to all the devotees would come there to mount washington to celebrate christmas and but Behind it all, of course, is Master and Swami himself would emphasize, we must remember what we're doing on Christmas. Yes, in America, of course, it's a social tradition, you know, and uh, uh, but uh, maybe not so much in the East, in India, it's, uh, because it has, doesn't have quite the same, you might say, historical impact. But Master said, it's important to remember that we keep, Christ on the altar because he, he felt that he was part of our Kriya Yoga tradition. And I'd like to mention some, speak a little bit about that a little bit today and the importance and had to, he and that he was, Christ was, Jesus Christ was an avatar, just as are the other masters in our lineage. Tehiri Mahashai, Swami, Sri Yukteswar, Master, of course, and of course, of course, Babaji, they were avatars who incarnated, as did Jesus Christ, they, and any avatar, one who's completely free, no compulsion of karma or anything, but, and so consequently, when they do come, they tend to play a role, some specific, there's a reason for them, for their coming. They don't come to live in a cave, you know, away from society generally, because they come for a reason. It's God's, you could say God's will. And it's often a, you know, according to, you might say the evolution of the divine plan for the age in which they appear with a certain message for an influence, you might say. Some of them have an outward role that's more historical than others and some are a little bit in the background but yet coming for specific purposes for historical reasons and spiritual historical reasons and so it was also with the with the life of jesus christ and he came at a very specific time in history to change the course of history and if we look back on the last two thousand years and this is worldwide not just in the west he had a tremendous influence. I mean, you could say that history in those last couple of millennia has been, would not be anywhere near what it, what unfolded had it not been for his presence. Now, 
did he know that the impact? Uh, I can't know. Then you're getting the speculation. It's in the it's in the divine world there, but that one being, that one human, came in, and it's like if you see you've seen those on YouTube. You can go see these uh, this thing that people do. They set up dominoes, you know, and sometimes uh, thousands of these dominoes in some intricate pattern. And you tip that very first domino and it's, you know, we've all done that probably as kids in some fashion or another and all the dominoes go over. It was like that. He was that domino, that domino effect that took place in historically this pattern where peoples in the West, at least, where he had the most impact, changed. History changed people's relationship to God changed. And over the centuries that followed, it was tremendous uh, movement unfolded from him. Now, he must have, and I often think when I look back, I wonder what Master was really like, because I didn't have, I was born just in the very end of his life, in the 40s and the early 50s, but I had obviously I didn't meet him. I knew, I knew Master through Swami, but I some wonder what he was like in person. And then I think, haven't you asked thought that in your own life? What would have been like? And then I, I think the same thing. Wonder what Sri Teshwar was like, or if I was right there with him, or or Lady Masha, or Babaji, of course. Babaji is, you know, he can maybe appear to us so we could find out. But all of these great masters are like that. And, and but they were a little bit closer, so we can get some historical references by what people said very close that knew them but what about jesus christ he was way back then and it's the only thing he's come down through some through some of the gospels in the bible some accounts but there's no real historical record outside of that so it's hard but one thing i feel it must be with him oh, he was probably kind and so on and wise but he definitely was a man of power now when we celebrate Christmas, we think of the, you know, the sort of the mild, the child in the, in the cradle, in the manger, that sort of image comes up. But really, also, when I think of Christ, Jesus, I think of a man of tremendous power. And I think we honor that power also in that personality. Think about it, that here was somebody who was able to... Uh, people were met. He was a mag, the magnetism that must have came off of him. And I'd like to read us a, a little bit of a quote from the Bible here, how it's described. And he says, it goes like this. He says, uh, we read in the Bible, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And remember, Peter was, was married. And going, and going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And you read that, I read reading that statement or that part of the Bible, he called to them and he says immediately, they recognized something. Here was a man of, and he must have been a man of tremendous power. They recognized something in him, and immediately they dropped what they were doing and they followed him. Now, very likely, they were disciples from past lives, and that memory was awakened him. But he seemed to have, here he is, he appears out of nowhere, so to speak, as he begins his mission. But we know that it's not from nowhere that he came. Because Master said that he had been preparing for that mission, God, that he had been entrusted him as a divine mission to 
make a significant change of course in the spiritual traditions of the West. That was a time when Rome was in the ascendant and the, the various pagan beliefs that they had. And of course he appeared in as a Jew in the Jewish tradition because he himself being that. And, in, and the Jews were, were faithful in their own way to God. So it was in that tradition, but he was going to influence it in a very different course that would ultimately change the world. And so he came. But, it, but And we know, as Master said, that it doesn't say in the Bible, but Master said he was preparing. He had studied in those years as a youth and as a young man. He had studied and he had visited wise men in the East. And the wise men and, and specifically had gone to India and brought back those teachings. That when the time was ready for him and he came. And it was not a complex mission that he was, or message. People, uh, he wasn't speaking philosophy. He was, but he wasn't outwardly setting people down and giving them a philosophical discourse. He framed his message in everyday language to the common man. And he framed it in stories, he framed it in parallels. But in essence, his message, as I says, were not complex, but there were some basic principles that he was making that resonate today he says, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is at hand. It is right here. It's not out there. That kingdom is God right here. And he said, he said, he framed his message in two uh, commandments, you might say. And the two commandments were, uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he went on to say, on these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. And that's not just in Galilee. That's throughout, the, uh, throughout all of spirituality. Those two commandments are universal. That's Sanatan Dharma right there. Love, love, love God and then love thy neighbor as thyself. And those two messages basically were the essence of what his mission was. And then, of course, he, 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 he added on to it in, in, you know, gave stories that, but underneath it, it was those two. And those two messages set off a spiritual revolution in Israel. And ultimately that spiritual revolution spread throughout the Western world. And, and it resonates today. Now, why do I say revolution? It was in a sense of a political revolution, but Notice in those two statements, there's nothing in those, there's no philosophy in there. There's no, there's nothing about organizations. There's nothing about religious institutions or churches or rituals. There's nothing in there about beliefs. It was a call. It was a call to go directly to God. And that was not only revolutionary, but it was also a very threatening thing to his society in which he found himself. Because why? He said, you don't need priests. You don't need intermediaries. You have a, you have a relationship with God. And that relationship with is your answerable first to God, not to civil authority or to organizations or, or any of that. Love God is in your heart. God is within you. And that's to whom you must answer when the day comes for your passing. And to this day, this is why even you find in authoritarian countries, uh, such as, like for example, I, I go to China from time to time, but uh, it's threatening. Religion is threatening. Now, why in some countries like that is religion a threat? It's because, and actually in China, as my experience was, they don't care what you believe as an individual, but you get together with other, because it's natural to when you 
find God, you find something that's meaningful to you in your relationship, you want to share it with others. And so now you start getting a group of people. And the devotee, because he's answerable first to God, and he's not answerable to civil authority, you can't control him. You can because he'll die for his beliefs. And so it was in Rome. So it was to the civil authorities there. They were willing to die for their beliefs, for their, for their experience, their one-to-one -one relationship. And it's from that one-to-one -one relationship that God is within us. With God, we must commune. It's with God with who we must place our trust. And it's with, it, with God that we must consummate our love with that. With, with, with God and that comes from direct experience you can only experience that direct you can only experience that love that Jesus Christ was speaking about is through love of oneness the bliss of God through experiencing it in ourselves it's not about outer dark uh, outer dogmas or anything like that and that was the essence of his mission and you could say this was why master emphasized his when he brought his teachings out of India and he came to the West he says he came to resurrect original Christianity and now that original Christianity was the basic teachings of Christ but that were based on these precepts of love God and love thy neighbor as thyself in other words love God seek God for yourself, but once you have that God, share it with others. And in this way, divine kingdom on this earth, the divine kingdom that we experience within ourselves, we can share that kingdom and bring that divine kingdom to this earthly plane. And so this basic foundation is, uh, is the essence of what Christianity is, original Christianity, what he meant by that, what Swan, when Paramahansa Yogananda meant to resurrect that in individual Christian or original Christianity based upon not belief, but direct experience. And that's what Master taught. Don't believe, just believe, but also experience. And through one's direct experience, we truly then know. He who knows, he knows. Well, Jesus goes about, you know, these two elements of love God and you know and then uh, with all your heart mind and soul, body and soul and thy neighbor as thyself well somebody asked him as he a little bit after that as Jesus was on his um, uh, his travels about the Holy Land at that time somebody I think it was a lawyer I can't remember from the Bible exactly but asked him who is my neighbor because he would say this message, thy neighbor is thyself. Well, who is my neighbor that I should be loving? And Jesus, it's, it's at that point that Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, if you don't know the Good Samaritan, I'll quickly say it. Now, Samaria was a land close to uh, Judea where uh, the Bible plays out. And, uh, but the Sumerians uh, were not necessarily in, of the Jewish tradition. They were offshoots, other, they had other beliefs. And so they were somewhat, uh, they were obviously not in favor in, amongst the Jewish people. So he, uh, but they were the neighboring country, you might say to the north, I believe it is, of Judea. And there's, he tells a story that there was a, a man who was traveling on the road, uh, uh, a Jewish man who traveling on the road, he was set upon by robbers and the robbers took his money, everything he possessed and beat him and threw him in the ditch on the wayside. And there he was laying in the ditch. And a uh, first one fellow comes by and I think this first fellow was a priest in the, in the, in the synagogue he comes by and he sees him there and he, and the, he can see obviously the man needs help, but he, he passes on by. He didn't want to, he didn't want to get involved. So he lets him lie there. And then he, uh, uh, a second man comes by 
and he too sees him down there in the ditch and he obviously need of help and he away he goes by too he just he just uh turns his back on him and finally a third fellow comes by and this fellow is from samaria and so he was a samaritan he was not a jew and but he was a neighbor and he sees the fellow down in the ditch so immediately he goes down he lifts the fellow out of the ditch brings him up and he he gets water he cleans him he cleans him up he binds his wounds then he he gets his he's got a, a donkey with him and he puts him on his donkey and he takes him to the very next village and finds an inn and he he finds a room for him in the inn and he gives the money he gives money to the innkeeper and says please take care of him i'm, I'm on my way here's money to cover the cost of taking care of him and if his need should exceed what I give you now. When I come back through here, I will pay you the difference. And so Jesus asks the man who asked him the question, he says, which of these three was this man's neighbor? And obviously it was the Samaritan. It was not, you know, of his tribe or of his caste or of his group, but he was a, a stranger and of, of a totally different uh, system. And he says, then Jesus concludes to the lawyer, he says, go and do likewise. That's what he meant. He says, then so to, to love thy neighbor as thyself. Do, in other words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is the golden rule, which is an interesting golden rule. Uh, somebody once did a study of all the religions of the world trying to find common ground. What what do all religions agree on? And he, he ultimately decided it was that one thing, the golden rule, do unto others as you, as you would have others do unto you. And basically, this second commandment is that's, you could say that's what Christianity, love thy neighbor as thyself, is focused upon. And as it, as it's developed down through the ages it's taken that aspect you could say christianity and many churches are known for this is is the good works doing good works compassion to those in need uh the breaking down of barriers that we're all brothers in god sisters in god and this aspect of the two commandments is it's very worthy that people should do this and this is had a tremendous impact historically on societies breaking down those barriers and bringing that sense of compassion and love into society and to the religious path. But, but it was the second commandment. And sometimes you could say that the tradition of Christianity focusing upon the second, as noble as it is, still is missing that foundation of the first commandment, which, which when you don't have that first foundational commandment, the second loses its spice, you might say, or loses its meaning. Love the Lord thy God. And when the master came, he wanted to restore original Christianity because he admired that compassionate side of Christianity. But he said that inner side of loving God directly without the intermediaries at, at those external organizations, rituals, hierarchies, those things, going back to the original principles, that is what is needed. Now, needed just, not just in the West, of course, that's needed, both of those commandments are needed worldwide. This is Sanatana Dharma, those two elements of one-pointed love for God, and then upon receiving that love, experiencing that love, the natural impulse of truly, the natural impulse of his great one is to share with other people and to then treat thy neighbor as thyself and being useful. That's what master, when he was saying, he, he loved the, of all human relationships, he loved most the relationship of friendship. Now, why? Why friendship? 
He says, well, in friendship, there's no compulsion of love. There's no obligation biologically that might be in some or socially that might be in others. Friends are freely chosen. And to be a friend to all was what he modeled in his own life. And this, he said, was what Christ was also like. He was a man of great power, a man of great magnetism, a man of the ability to command, but yet underneath it all in a mild and gentle way as a friend to change other people with the look as a great master would do, just as, 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 as master himself was able to change people just by a look, to look into their heart and people would feel that power. Such is the power of any great soul. Such, of course, is the power of an avatar. And you could say perhaps it was those times, the Roman Empire, the time when, when you could say that a certain era had run its course and something new, that religion itself had become somewhat uh, strictly scriptural. Now, scripture has its place too, but it takes living scriptures to truly interpret the, the laws, to truly interpret what divine uh, will is, what Sanatana Dharma is. And this is why Master Sao used to always say that it is saints, those who know God, are the true scriptures. They are the ones, the custodians of religion. And so in such times, an avatar comes. Great souls need to, just as the, the Buddha came at a time when a certain correction was needed. And of course, Master considered Shankara a master of that quality. He too came at a time when another correction, you might say, was needed at that time. So what it was with Moses in you know, a long time before Christ, he too made a certain correction. And all of these great ones come. And in our time, the great souls that have come to also make those corrections. But all of those corrections point us to this message. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul, all thy strength, another strength. In other words, all thy energy. That underlies everything what the great saints are saying you look back on the great ones in india chaitanya you look back on ramakrishna you look at all the great masters that have come out of that soil they all carry that same message and that's the same message that christ jesus christ expressed in his lifetime now we must too realize that when we celebrate christmas we see that, you know, even the traditional, you know, Jesus in the manger and all of these, it warms the heart. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heartfelt feeling. But that light that always goes with those stories, the light shining in the east, the light appearing to the shepherds, there's always this reference to light. And it was that light, it's the light of the Christ consciousness. It was that consciousness that, that, uh, that, that power of oneness, that aspect of God, of the Christ consciousness, that only reflection in meaning the, the only door through which the soul will find its freedom. Now that's been interpreted in a sectarian way that Christ is the only son of God, but he didn't mean it that way. It's that awareness of the universality of that consciousness of intelligence of awareness of Christ consciousness in every atom of creation the om we hear that om sound and god bless us if we can and that om we begin to expand our consciousness till we hear in the essence of every atom in creation the Om is vibrating. Our consciousness goes with the Om until our consciousness permeates every atom in creation. And when that happens, we've achieved that state of Christ consciousness, universal consciousness in all creation. 
Now that is the goal of everyone. And that state is the door through which every soul is destined to someday pass through. And it's in that way, by expanding our consciousness through the Holy Spirit out toward infinity that we ultimately affect our freedom in God. And this is the message that Jesus brought to travel that path, bring the Holy Spirit into everything that we do. But that Holy, that Holy Spirit is experienced within ourselves. The kingdom of God is within each one of us, within the heart of each one of us. And our message or the message of Christ, which, which Master said he expressed to his disciples, this is what Yogananda brought. He brought that message of Christ. That God is within each one of us. But he brought an extra blessing with that. You could say the second coming of Christ. He said, we need tools. This is the age we live in that we can fulfill those commandments of Christ within our own lives by using the tools. And this is what our gurus in this age brought, is to be able to use that tools to affect those commandments that came with Jesus in his time. So as we celebrate Christmas, yes, it's, I think we, we just like any of our, our masters, when we think of the Hiri Mahashaya, we think of Babaji, we think of Paramahansa Yogananda, we see them as personalities. But remember, if we could see a little bit more deeply, just behind those outer faces, those outer images we see here on the altar, if we could see them clearly, we see that there's light. We just see just that there's just light there. And that light takes on a certain form, it takes on a certain expression, but it's the light of the Christ consciousness that is shining right behind them. And there, that light is not, as Swami used to say over and again, it's that light, they're shining that light, not to show how bright they are and how wonderful they are, but they're shining to remind us of our own individual potential. And I think when, this is why we celebrate these birthdays. We celebrate Master's birthday. We celebrate the Gurus, Guru Purnima, uh, the concept of the, of, the, of the Guru. But each of these ones, yeah, Lahiri and, and Shri Kadeshwar Bhavaji, we celebrate them because in each one of us, it reminds us of that light that's behind there. And so in a sense, Christmas is that. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we were also was able to keep that spirit alive every day of the year, not just Christmas, that every day be a Christmas, that every day be a time of joy, that we can bathe ourselves in communion with God and that Christmas spirit of sharing God. And that's the, you could say, in any of these great holidays, you know, in Diwali, you give gifts. Christmas you give. Well, now what are we doing there? Those gifts is not the thing. The gift is a symbol of that desire to share the awakened joy, I hope, the awakened joy within us. And then we share it, thy neighbor as thyself, and be able to help other people as well as ourselves. And so I wish, and Sadhadevi and I both together, we wish all of you a Merry Christmas, joyous Christmas, happy <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> and it's, it's on this special day and let every day be Christmas. And so we're going to conclude. And I hope, I hope uh, Aditya's out there is going to play a, uh, something. We'll do a little RT here. We'll hold up the light and think in terms of the light of the Christ consciousness, the light of uh, that star shining in the east, the representation within each one of us. Let's take that light in and feel that blessings of the Christ consciousness within us, especially, especially today. So, okay, now I'm gonna have Sadhana Devi, we're gonna turn here, Sadhana, turn yourself sideways. And we have the light here. And uh, I'm gonna just Let's see if I can move, move this a little so bit. You got, it, you got it? Okay, yeah, you can turn. Yeah. So take the light, be careful not to slash it too much. And we'll do the RT. Uh, 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 uh,
all of the, those of you who feel so inclined to take the light of the masters into your life into okay. your life i can't move any further that's all good you just do your best okay, okay. all right so we're both going to be holding it okay Now let's take these, let's take these blessings and let's raise our arms and hands and let us send out to our neighbors throughout the world. Put our hands together, send it out with blessings of home. Oh, oh. conclude with a prayer heavenly father heavenly divine God. mother God. friend heavenly beloved God. God create masters Jesus. of self-realization Jesus Christ Babaji Krishna Lahiri Mahashaya Swami Sri Yukteswar beloved Guru Paramahansa Yogananda saints of all religion we humbly bow to you all Beloved Jesus Christ, may thy joy, may thy light, may thy love reach out into this world to touch all souls with thy message of God consciousness, thy message that we should love God first and foremost, body, mind, soul, and spirit with all of our strength. May everyone be touched in that spirit. May you flow through us in all that we do every day of our lives. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om Guru, Om Guru. May the light of Christ consciousness shine within all of you. Merry Christmas to everybody.